So we're going to multiply complex numbers. And just remember, going to FOIL, I'm going to recommend that you change the order. We know multiplication is uh, commutative, so it doesn't matter which terms you multiply first as long as you match, multiply all four uh, combinations. So we're going to FOIL. So we're going to go first, last, and then the middle, whatever you call it, outside, inside. So FOIL, but do it in this order. You'll save a little time. So go ahead and FOIL right now, or FLOY. Are there any algebra questions with the steps I have on the board? Wouldn't it be minus 4i? Yes, yeah, that should be a negative, negative 4i. All right, so I can combine like terms. So we got negative 4i plus 3i. That is minus 1i, or just minus i. What can I do with six i, negative 6i squared? What is i squared? Oh, very good. All right, so i squared is negative 1. So this is really 2 plus 6 right here. Or 2 minus 6 times negative 1. 2 plus 6 minus i. So that is complex multiplication. Just remember all the regular algebra rules, and i squared is negative 1. It's about all that you really need. So I'll do one more practice problem. All right, let's get crazy and multiply three terms together. So I recommend you so in this case, you want to multiply two of the terms first. It doesn't matter which two. Multiplication is associative. So let's multiply these first two terms together first. So we're going to distribute i across here. And now 3i minus i squared. That is minus i squared is 1. I recommend you put your complex, when you're going to FLOY, that you put the imaginary parts second. So these are written with the imaginary parts first. So I'm going to reverse the order. 3 plus i is this, uh, 3i plus 1 is the same as 1 plus 3i. And i plus 1 is the same as 1 plus i. So go ahead and FLOY right here. and do all the simplification. So in this product, you should have gotten negative 2 plus 4i. 
Are there any algebra questions on this? So this is a math sentence. Can anybody read and translate this into an English sentence? We've seen this symbol, I think. All right, I'm opening up to anybody. The real numbers are opposite. So this is a subset right there. So it says the real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers. You've definitely seen R before, that capital R. So the, this says the real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers. Of course, we write in math because it takes a lot less time to write out sentences. All right, so the real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers. How does this work? Well, just think about the complex numbers. They are all numbers you can write as a plus b i. What happens when b is equal to 0? Remember, b can be any real number. So what happens when b is 0? This would be a plus 0 i, or just a. So if you have your complex number, if you think of your complex numbers, we're uh, all the subset of all numbers with a zero imaginary part, that's your real numbers right there. So you can think about real numbers as a subset of the complex numbers. We don't get to do cool geometric things with complex numbers until pre-calculus 2 class. So you'll have to wait until then before we can look a little more deeply at complex numbers. But we know enough right now uh, <coughs> to at least factor polynomials. So ready for the fundamental theorem of algebra? So what does fundamental theorem of algebra say? Any polynomial Doesn't matter if the coefficients are whole numbers, rational numbers, irrational numbers, or even complex numbers. Any polynomial of degree one or more has at least one complex zero. Now, I just wrote down the math sentence that the complex numbers are a subset of the real numbers, which means this complex zero could also very well be a real number, an integer, or a rational number. So this just says if your degree is one or more, you're going to have zeros. You're going to have at least one zero. So if we apply the fundamental theorem multiple times and keep dividing out by the factors that we find as we find zeros, we can reduce, we can factor any polynomial eventually. So let's look at the conjugate pairs theorem now. So if our polynomial p of x has real coefficients, and every polynomial I'm going to give you will have real coefficients, so if p has real coefficients, then Then complex zeros 
occur in conjugate pairs. So have I used the word conjugate? I think I have. Let's look at conjugates as they relate to complex numbers now. So we remember, or hopefully remember about conjugates, they're fun to multiply. So if you have a minus b times a plus b, without doing all the foiling work, you're going to have a squared minus b squared. So that's how conjugates factor. It's also known as difference of squares if you think about naming it for the other side, the right side. All right. so. These are real number conjugates. Complex conjugates work the exact same way. So what's the conjugate of A minus B I? A plus B I, very good. All right, go ahead and floy this out right now. And I'll give you a big hint. You don't need to look at outside inside terms because they are conjugates and they better cancel out. What does our product simplify to? A squared plus B squared. Yep, A squared plus B squared. So we just gained the ability to factor A squared plus B squared. If you factor it, though, you have to factor of the imaginary numbers. All right, so that is complex conjugates at work right there. So if you think about the conjugate pairs theorem, what that means is F if x equals a plus b i is a zero of the real coefficient polynomial, p of x, then x equals a minus b i is also a zero of p of x. So what was the big important correspondence theorem about zeros of polynomials? So each zero corresponds to a factor of a polynomial and vice versa. So we're going to look at the big correspondence theorem now. I think I use the letter R. X equals R is a 0 of P of X exactly when X minus R is a factor. So just like in Star Wars, there is no try, there's only do in math. So I'm going to look at <coughs> this correspondence theorem with complex zeros. So if x equals a plus bi is a 0 of p of x, then what will the factor look like? So it'll be x minus that number right there. So that's what the factor would look like. So all we did is took the 0 and turned it into the factor, which is x minus that number. So that's no different than the correspondence theorem right there. 
So if, you, if that was a zero, then we get this factor. We also get from the pair theorem that x equals a minus bi is a factor, uh, is a zero. Thus, x minus a minus bi is a factor. So if we have a complex zero or factor, we're going to get another complex zero or factor. That is just the conjugate. So ready for our first example, it uses these ideas. Write a polynomial with real coefficients and zeros. x equals 3, x equals negative 1, and x equals 2 plus i. There are an infinite number of correct answers. There's also way more incorrect answers available. So just write down one polynomial that has these zeros. It can have plenty of other properties, too. So remember, you need the correspondence theorem. I told you about three zeros, so what does that mean about factors? You know about three factors right now. So do your best to write out the product of those factors. You don't have to expand it out. I'm not interested in you foiling this crazy polynomial out. Just write it out in factored form. And I'll give you a hint. It's going to look like x minus something, x minus something else, x minus something else. I just wrote it out as a product of the three factors, each of which corresponds to the zero written right above it. And it's just x minus that number right there. So any questions on writing out those factors? This polynomial is not going to have real number coefficients. If we multiply it out, if we just look at the constant term that will emerge, if you multiply those three numbers together, you get a complex number. So this polynomial is not going to have real coefficients. So what, what about the, um, that complex conjugate theorem? Would yep. We not have another? So we're going to use the complex conjugate theorem. I wanted real coefficients. So the only way to avoid real coefficients if you have a complex zero or factor is you need the conjugate. Okay. So I'm going to write the incorrect conjugate. And I want you to tell me why it's wrong. So don't copy this down. This is almost a conjugate, but what is wrong? It needs to be x minus 2 minus alpha. So I flipped the wrong sign. So you need to flip the sign of the complex number. So you want the conjugate of the complex number. So it's going to be x minus 2 minus i. You could clean it up a little bit. So you could write it out like that. If you have a lot of time to kill, which hopefully I'm giving you enough homework that you don't have lots of time to kill, you could superfoil this all together and get a degree 4 polynomial. But that's not terribly exciting to do. So we'll skip that step. Well, could we not um, 
foil at least the last part together? Yeah, uh, it's probably good practice to foil that right there. You're going to have to go super, what I call super foiling, whereas you match up each term in the first with each term in the second. So you should have nine products that you get out of there. Yeah, is three squared is nine. So you would get, if I wrote out really quickly the combinations, those three, those three, and then those three right there. So that would be the, all the products you'd have to make. <coughs> These could be raised to higher powers. It doesn't really matter because I didn't specify the degree of the polynomial I wanted. If I told you it needed to be degree 5, you would need to carefully pick uh, powers right there. If I told you information about the graph, maybe I wanted certain end behavior. Uh, there may be another coefficient in the front that might show up, but I didn't put any additional information in here. So there's lots of correct answers. But any of the correct answers would have included these four factors right there. So we're going to do our last polynomial example. Now I could ask the question as completely factor the polynomial, or I could ask you to find all zeros real and complex. Because we've seen that every factor corresponds to a zero. So if I ask you about factors, I could ask the same question about zeros. You would just answer slightly different form. So completely factor our polynomial f of x, 3x to the fourth plus 5x cubed plus 25x squared plus 45x minus 18. Completely factor over the complex numbers. So just naively looking at this, I can't quite factor a 3 out, and I can't quite factor a 5 out. So right away, there's nothing I can factor out without doing some more work. So how do we start factoring on degree 4, or anything really above 2? We have to find the um, RZT. Right. So we're looking for rational zeros. So you want to look at factors of 18 divided by factors of 3. So we're going to use the, oops, that's the wrong R, rational zero theorem. So we're looking at factors of 18 divided by factors of 3. So 3 to only has two factors, a prime number. It's got 1 and 3. 18's got quite a few factors. So I'll try to get them in increasing order. One, two, three. There's no four, five. There is a six, a nine, and an 18. Did I miss any? I don't think I did. All right, so we're going to write out all possible zeros. So we're going to pair up everything, uh, all the factors of 18 with each individual uh, denominator of 1, and then each factor with the denominator of 3. So we're just pairing up all combinations. Now, these are all divided by 1, so I'm not going to write over 1, over 1, over 1. Now I'm going to use a 3, denominator of 3, so we get 1 third, 2 thirds, I could write 3 thirds, but I see that I already have 3 thirds on my list. So I'm not going to rewrite 3 thirds in here. No, I'll rewrite it, but I'll cross it out so we don't use it. 6 thirds. Do we have 6 thirds on our list? Yeah. 